Man Up, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. And now, it's time to Man Up. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio, broadcasting on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. I am Joe Stopulus, and today I am joined by Dr. Todd Warner from the Word on Fire Institute. We are going to be discussing the topic of poetry. Specifically, how to get into reading poetry. If you're someone like myself, uh, it's something I've always wanted to get into. It's something I've tried to get into. And Dr. Warner is uh, what I would call an expert in this field. He recently wrote and helped publish the most recent Word on Fire journal, uh, whose subject was poetry. So a perfect guy to have on for this episode. Let us start in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. Do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you follow the show for a while, you know that there are various subjects like the arts uh, that I have tried to dive into. And I feel like you guys are kind of going along the journey with me. Uh, especially when it comes to things like literature, where I was kind of, you know, dipping my toe into uh, and learning along the way. This will be by far my most novice, uh, my most novice of all the arts that we've discussed. You know, I, I had, I, I have a pretty good understanding of music and a, and a good appreciation. I can speak fairly intelligently on that. Literature, I'm getting there. I'm still kind of a novice a little bit in that, but I've, I've read enough to know. The po- poetry is just something I'm not, it's not my strong suit. And it's something I think we as Catholic men, we as uh, people who want to have a broad understanding uh, of the world and what the world has to offer and what the literary themes of, of poetry can bring us into, what we should be as a well-rounded gentleman uh, should be able to understand poetry and have at least some appreciation for it. So as I mentioned, the Word on Fire Institute Journal uh, that comes out quarterly, the most recent uh, the most recent subject, it's always on a certain subject, was on poetry. Uh, and Dr. Todd Warner is one of the heads over there of the Institute, specifically around the journal. So excited to have him on on the other side of the break to help us dive into exploring this world of poetry. Stick around and we'll be right back. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by Golden Rule Heating and Cooling. Since 1999, Golden Rule Heating and Cooling has been supporting customers with their rules to live by. Respect, understanding, loyalty, expertise, and service. Golden Rule Heating and Cooling is a family-run business, reminding you of the Golden Rule. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Golden Rule Heating and Cooling. GoldenRulePHC.com Thank you, Golden Rule Heating and Cooling, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Hi, this is Father John Ricardo, and I want to thank Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory for underwriting Christ is the Answer. Losing a loved one, as we know, is never easy, and it can leave you feeling lost and even hopeless at times. But Caldwell Parish helps ease that burden by sincerely caring both about your loss and about your faith. Caldwell Parish Funeral Home and Crematory is Des Moines' only Catholic-owned and operated funeral home. Their number is 515-276-0551 or online at caldwellparish.com. My help comes from you. Right here and welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I'm excited today to have on Dr. Todd Warner. He is a husband, father, practicing internal medicine physician, and the managing editor of the Evangelization and Culture Journal at the Word on Fire Institute, which I have talked about on the show before. Dr. Warner, welcome to the show. Joel, thanks for having me. It's just great to be here. So this is a an episode I've been wanting to have for a long time. Uh, I have had episodes on how to get into classical music. We had the uh, the maestro of the Des Moines Symphony on for a couple episodes. I've talked about reading great literature. I've talked about art, a lot of things about getting into these pieces, well, getting into whatever these various things of art are. I also happen to know a little bit about those things. I know very little about poetry outside of the fact that I want to get into it. You are going to help us today get into <laughs> poetry. So thank you for doing that. Well, I don't feel any pressure at all here, Joe. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, listen, the, the entire world's on your shoulders. I used to, on these other episodes, I could help 
augment the conversation. That's not the case today. <laughs> shape I'm flying form. solo this day. Is this yeah, how you're? Is that what you're saying to me? But I so I will be in the seat of the listener who will be learning uh, along with you. So let me give you a little background. So for our listeners who are not maybe uh, uh, um, accustomed to or uh, understand the Word on Fire journal, it is. I don't have the ninth one we're on. How many are we on right yeah, now? Yeah, ninth one has been released, and okay. it is it is poetry. Yes, so it's, it's a, a quarterly quarter. journal. A quarterly journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Um, uh, and it's seasonal and it's thematic. So each one has that. So sometimes we've had one co- coming up on freedom. We've had, we've had some on creativity, one on the digital age, one on economics. Um, so they're, they're wide ranging. They're, they're living up to the reputation of yeah. Catholic universal, um, with themes per, for each particular issue. Yeah. It, it's been, it's been great. And I've had Jared Zimmer on, we've talked about some of it and, and I, I encourage my listeners to support uh, the work on word on fire. I think what you guys are doing is clearly changing lives. Thank you. And it's evangelizing the culture and similar to the word on fire Bible, which is a, a treasure trove. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful Bible with beautiful art and and the commentaries are great. This is kind of in the same vein as that. These, these journals, which are, they're beautiful. They're well-written. Uh, and this most recent one was on poetry. And I, I, I shot you an email. I'm like, listen, <laughs> we need someone on to talk about this because I need to, I need to learn about poetry. I, I have books of poetry at my house. I try to read them. I would say I can handle things that have rhyme schemes that I understand and they're pithy. That's about where mine ends. So <laughs> can you help us understand maybe first off, why let's start with the why, why yeah. should we be reading poetry? Why is it something that as a, as a Catholic man, it's important to even do in the first place. And then maybe once we establish that, why let's kind of walk into the how. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, you know, um, I, listen, I, w- I was the same skeptic that you are. Uh, I, I grew up, um, I, I'm going to tell you a really quick story just kind of to lead off here. Okay. So I was in fourth grade at Mason City, um, Iowa. So you, you, you in Iowa know Wait, this. What? Mason, you know, yeah, I, 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 I spent three years in Iowa. They were wonderful years. Jefferson Elementary School in Mason City, Iowa is where... I truly, I first encountered poetry on a different level. I had no, a lot of good Greeks up in Mason City. There's oh, a lot yeah, of my, my brethren are up that way. That's great. Yeah. So, so, so there I was in fourth grade. I was new to the school and Miss Duffy was my teacher um, who was extraordinary. Miss Gerald, I think it's Gerald, Geraldine Duffy, lovely woman. Um, and uh, she had this great gray shock of hair and bright red lipstick and these big glasses. And she had a limp from polio from years before and was just a, a bright light. And I just love Miss Duffy. And then one day Miss Duffy uh, asked the class to go home and memorize Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening, which is four stanzas, 16 lines long. And all of a sudden I realized my crush on Miss Duffy was very tenuous that it was, it was something that, that was definitely conditional and it was really being harmed by being asked to memorize poetry. So for a couple of weeks, I stood by my dad's lazy boy and recited to him stumbling and mumbling over Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening, only to find myself, you know, again, two or three weeks hence, standing next to the L-shaped desk, uh, class of 28, one kid after the other popping up and reciting this entire, this entire poem in, t- in front of the entire rest of the class and then sitting back down. And when it, when it came to me, with clammy hands and sweat trickling down the back of my neck. Um, I went into a fugue. I didn't remember what happened. I recited Robert Frost stopping by woods on snowy evening. And I got sat down realizing I didn't fail because the next kid sat and stood up and started. And I thought I will never have to read this again. I, I don't get it. I don't really particularly like it. I didn't like the pressure of doing that. And poetry is not for me. Fast forward um, 20 years or, or, or thereabouts. I'm in uh, my third year of internal medicine residency. I'm working on a very, very harrowing evening of, of moonlighting, admitting patient after patient, very sick, two patients down, five to go, sitting at two in the morning, all my pagers are going off, and I'm sitting at the nurse's station waiting for a urologist to get back to me, and what poem should invade my consciousness but Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening? Now, as a fourth grader, if anybody's read this, it's a story about a guy who just rides with his horse and a wagon behind him full of ostensibly supplies for work. And he pauses in the middle of the woods and sits and just, just is, and then he rides on. That's all it is. And as a fourth grader, I'm like, why am I reading this? This is the most boring poem. As a stressed out third year internal medicine resident, I understood the poem for the first time. Mm. And it was all about the notion of a guy who's working late, who misses home. And in the midst of the call 
to, to for miles to go before you sleep and promises to keep. And in the midst of the ruminations of what you've done before you and how you could have done it better, he pauses and he holds the reins of the horse that's ever bucking and shaking his harness bells. And he basically says, um, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to be here now. I'm going to practice intentionality without saying that. I'm not going to obsess about the future. I'm going to plan. I'm not going to ruminate about the past. I'm going to reflect. I'm going to be here now in such a vivid fashion that he hears he feels the, the easy wind and he hears the downy flake landing on, on the soft snow carpeting below, below him. And I realized that was me. That was me that I had gotten too caught up in the race that I was losing myself. I was losing myself in the present. And, and, and that, that um, epiphany for me was instrumental in making me reapproach a lot of things, literature being one of them, poetry being the other, and saying, I think I don't think I gave this stuff a good shot. The other thing I'll say is the problem with the way we're taught poetry in school is I want you to read a poem that has little context. I want to have you find symbols everywhere that you can't even see. I, I might even politicize it if I'm that kind of a teacher. I'm going to have you cram this stuff in and then get graded on it. And I don't know if there's any other way to destroy the love for poetry. That's that's one of the best ways to do it. I heard I heard someone. So I got into literature in the last five, six, seven years. And someone talking about great expectations, like, well, I don't I don't like great expectations because when I was told to read it, I was more concerned about what color Pip's hat was than I was. Exactly. About the, you know. exactly. exactly. And by the way, Flannery O'Connor, when she went to speak down at, um, at in Georgia, one of the universities, and she was being peppered by the English professor who's so excited about, again, why is the why is the misfits hat in his, uh, her book, her story? A good man is hard to find. Why is the misfits hat black? Um, you know, does that symbolize evil or da, 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 da? And she's like, no, it, that's just the color of the hat men wore in those days. <laughs> so 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 I guess the, the point is, is that, um, you know, Chesterton has a great line about um, there, there's an essay he wrote about re- reading Shakespeare. And there's a, there's a critic that was that was very good at writing about Shakespeare and has all these nuanced insights and so on. And he says, she is very wise and I am very ignorant with respect to Shakespeare. I know little more than the trifling, the trifling fact that I've read his works. And it's totally tongue in cheek because what we're asked to do is we're asked to encounter the works. Yes, it's nice when someone provides us context. It's nice when you read an essay about a poem that clarifies. It's nice when you have a teacher that leads you a little bit. But what I would invite people to do with poetry and with great literature is to sit down, turn on the fire, have a little drink next to you. It could whatever we want it to be, as long as you're of age, if it's appropriate, and and, and engage in the adventure, walk into the narrative, be enveloped in walking in someone else's shoes. And, and when you do that, especially reading, as Matthew Arnold would say, the best that has been written, that's how our culture should be defined by the best that has been written. If we reapproach it, you will be stunned, especially now that you're older, have kids, maybe lost a parent, have a new job, are unhappy about this or joyful about that. You will now say, this person's speaking to me about where I am right now. Um, so that, that that's that's maybe that's an intro. I don't know if that's even starting to, to move the needle for you. But no, I'm, I, I would I'm say so, I, the comparison I would make is to someone, and this is maybe an easier bridge, is all of us have experienced music that has spoken to our heart and taken yeah. us to a, to a higher, to a higher pitch, right. Or a piece of art that when you stare at it, you're kind of in awe and it takes you to a, to a new place. I think most of us have experienced that. I think poetry, I know I've experienced it in the little bit that I have done and, and read about it. Um, so I think there's kind of the, the why is it takes right. us to this, this higher plane in that, that just normal verse, just normal talking or whatever can't do. And it doesn't in a way that's, obviously different from literature, literature's stories. It's long usually, whereas this is fairly pithy uh, and direct. So let's start with the kind of maybe the how, um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, I get lost pretty quickly in a lot of, po- I mean, Gerard Man- Manley Hopkins, I, I'm, I put up stop, give me 10 years before I touch him again. I, know. I need to, I need to, but let's, let's kind of baby step our way there. What are your recommendations for getting into it? The how, the, the how to understand how to read this stuff? You know, what I would say is it's a great question. I, I think, again, a lot of times people pick ones like, a, a, like I, I don't know, Gerard Manley Hopkins, is, he's a genius. He's extraordinary. But if he's your first taste of poetry, like you said, you're going to say, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. And and I, I be, as a result, I'm going to walk away from it. What I would say, I, this is my bias. I'd say read Robert Frost. Robert Frost is ex, is extremely approachable. Um, he's, he's American. He's, he's, it's English. Obviously it's not been translated. He's 20th century. Um, and the one thing I'll say about Robert Frost is, you know, as much as his seem to be about pastoral settings, you know, farmlands or mending walls or things of that nature, the long and the short is there's only two poems in the entire uh, canon of Frost's works that don't have a human being in them. 
Mm-hmm. So that's that's one thing. So it's, it's in case you're like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna read a f- reflection about a barn that goes on for three days. No, no, no. That that's not what you're gonna encounter. The other thing I'll say is, um, it was uh, it was Lionel Trilling who was commemorating uh, uh, Robert Frost's 85th 85th birthday, and he shocked the literary world. I mean, at this at this this uh, party when he was when he was kind of honoring Robert Frost, but he said Robert Frost is a terrifying poet, and they thought that they considered that insulting. I don't think Frost did, but others are like, you got to take that back. That's an insult and so on. And he had to go and explain it. And the long and the short is what he said is the thing about Robert Frost. And I would say this is the thing about a lot of poetry is it asks us to confront ourselves. It actually, it actually shows you something that maybe you've buried something that you haven't attended to. Why? Because you're so damn busy because your life is dead. It is dedicated to efficiency as opposed to intentionality. And, and so, and so there's many things that Robert Frost writes and it, it's sort of like Christ's parables. It could be seemingly a story with unbelievably profound roots within them. So my, so my way of thinking, start with Robert Frost, start reading him. The other thing I'll say too, is you should, I want to take this with Gerard Manley Hopkins. Cause I want to, I want to, I want to turn you back to him. I want you to really, I want you to fall in love with Gerard. Give up. Hopkins. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is, this is my, this is my hard sell. I, sh- I shouldn't start with, you should buy this car. Yeah. And I should start with, you know, we start this car and move our way up. So. Uh, Paul, the, reading the, if we're, if we care about the poet's um, sensibility, and a lot of times I'd say the, 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 the poetic sensibility is one that um, wants to step away from politics and wants to step, a step away from, from the, 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 the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt myself and say, Charles Pagoy has a quote that says, that says, um, nothing is, is as new as old today as yesterday's newspapers. Oh, sorry, nothing is, is nothing is as old today as today's newspapers. Nothing is as new today as Homer. And so the mm-hmm. point is, is that Homer may be thousands of years old, but the bottom line is he's speaking to iconic truths that are, that, that, that stand the test of time. The notion of true poetry is to speak about human nature that transcends all time. So that someone like Robert Frost or Dante or Hopkins can speak in that way. So back to Hopkins for a second. Paul Mariani is a phenomenal professor. I think he's at a Boston college that I, was written for us. He actually wrote in the poetry issue about Paul, uh, about uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And the long and the short is he has a wonderful book called The Mystery of It All that helps to break down Hopkins. And when you read about his biography and you hear about the long suffering, but then he breaks down some of his verse, it is mind blowing. So I will say, I re- so I read the article and that was super helpful. It was super helpful to have, but so that, okay, let, me, let me move back to the next question then. For someone like, I mean, Hopkins is, is you know, very specifically to that, but even, even like Frost, I think it would be nice to have a Catholic lens with which yeah. to, to, so I will ask, does Joseph Pierce, who I've used for literary stuff and he's been on the show before, does someone like Joseph Pierce have these Catholic lenses with which that someone like me could buy as a helping guide in yeah, the world of poetry? Totally. And Joseph, and I love Joseph Pierce's works and I've written for his St. Austin Review and, and I've met him and yeah, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. I will say what I will say, though, is this. I want to I want to say to someone like you who's wanting to dip your toes in uh, even more, w- whatever the last time is that you encounter poetry, you're different now than the last time mm. you just are. And maybe if it's been a year, if it's been five years, it's been 10 years. I mean, you have five kids uh, married. Uh, you have your work. You have your side hustle and then you have your real hustle. I mean, the, the long and the short of it is, is that the, uh, what I want, what I'd like to do is I'd like to say uh, reapproach Wordsworth, reapproach Whitman. Reapproach Browning, reapproach um, Emily Dickinson. Um, you know what? I, I pulled this out. I have this. This has got to be like a twenty-five cent garage sale book. The immortal poems of the English language, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, it's of course it's it's from like nineteen fifty, whatever. But it's just got it's it's almost like a greatest hits of these works that tra- that that have been celebrated over the years. Now, some of them I like. Some of them I'm like I don't get this or this doesn't speak to me. But I, I part of me why I, while I want to have people like Mariani or or uh, um, Robert Cording who I, I we can go into him in a second Joseph Pierce they can help midwife us a little bit through this they can usher us through it which is wonderful. Part of this is saying I you have a Catholic lens that has been crafted over all these years. Don't underestimate how it will aid you in reapproaching even Frost who's not Catholic the Catholic sensibility that he offers. Um, and, and, and so it's almost like I want to say, read this stuff without a whole lot of pressure that you need to be an expert in poetry or you need to understand every every last thing about it. Read it as a human being who's who's getting up every morning, you know, waking your kids up, going to work, making money, trying to have a living, dealing with medical issues, dealing with this tr- the trials of the world. 
look at it with that lens and I guarantee you, you will find stuff that will say, this is mind blowing. And I read the same poem five or 10 years ago and it made no difference to me whatsoever. Todd, I think, I think you're right. When you think about just first off, I, I have purchased a handful of, uh, of collections of poetry. You know, uh, one of the, like, there's, there's a bunch of good ones. One of you know, Joseph Pierce actually has uh, like the 101 poems every Catholic yep. should know. There are a lot of good collections out there. So I would first kind of point you to that and say, at least get them right. So get them in your house, get at least a, a, maybe a good, you know, British and a good American or just a good collection uh, across the board. And then you have it, at least then you have it and you kind of start chewing through it. Um, I would say like a good glass of wine, that's kind of how you should view a a poem when we're approaching it. It is much more a, I'm not going to read through. I'm going to chew on the words. I'm going to read. It's very slow. I mean, it's kind of the way you should be reading scripture. Uh, very slowly rereading, rereading, and kind of stewing over it, and then letting it, letting it kind of swish around your mouth, and and um, and enveloping yourself in the poetry. And to your point, I think that's an important one, Todd. I I struggle with well, this is a, supposed to be a great poem, right? These are the hundred greatest poems, or whatever. Yeah. And this one didn't speak to me, yep. so if something's wrong with me. That's not the case, right? Um, there, are, I mean, so like I actually a few years ago decided to memorize Invictus. I don't know why I did, but I decided to do it, and it was. It was kind of a fun thing to do, and it was a great poem, but I also love rhyme schemes. I mean, I think the rhyme scheme also speaks to me more than other things. Well, that might be not the case for somebody else, but similar to music, I love Beethoven and Mozart and Debussy, and well, there are a lot of people who don't love Debussy, yeah. and they might not love Mozart or whatever those things are. And so within the world of poetry, not everything's going to fit, um, which I think for me is the hard part is I'm such a novice. I'm like, well, this is considered great poetry. I should probably know more about this or just speak to me or something like that. Okay. We have about one minute left. Any final pitches to get people into poetry or ways they can dip their feet into it? I really want to, I want to highlight everybody should read um, this wonderful book from Robert Cording, who did our academic feature in this issue. It's called Finding the World's Fullness uh, uh, on Poetry, Metaphor, and Mystery. It is so lyrical. It is so beautiful. And, and I just, I, I want to tell everybody what you just said. Everybody you don't have to like everything that everybody tells you to like. It's it's your encounter with your Catholic lens that will provide you the ability to d- to dive into the deeper sensibilities that are that are that are make us all human. And so, read great writers who like poetry and make poetry, but also revisit the the poet the poems that you've left behind. And I guarantee you, you will be made different as a result of it. So, yeah. uh, and I would I would go further and say you kept you talk about revisiting. Well, for me. Or visit alone. It's a first time, right? So it's a a first time foray into it. And I, when I do it, when I have dipped my toe into it, um, I have found it to be uh, an edifying experience. And it's, it is like, it's entering a a kind of an unstable ground. It's not something I was super familiar with. Um, But that's why I think my advice or my recommendation is just kind of just do it. Right. And I think just do it. The the resource you, can you say the resource again, one more time? The Robert Cording's uh, finding the world's fullness. Okay. And it's outstanding. By the way, also read Bob Dylan's Nobel uh, Nobel Prize uh, speech for uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. He talks about Moby Dick, All Quiet on the Western Front, and the Odyssey, and how they basically got into his marrow and formed his writing. Now, again, only one of those is an epic poem. The rest of them are novels. But the bottom line is, read those things that will transform you. Even if you don't know how it's transforming you, it will stick with you. It will stick with you. It will stick with you. Uh, I am uh, I'm about two thirds of the way through Moby Dick right now, and all I'm getting is a lot of whale facts talk. Uh, so, so that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> keep plowing, baby. Keep plowing. I'm going to keep going. Dr. Todd, thanks so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank you, Joe. Great to talk to you. Stick around. We'll head to a short break and we'll be right back. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Savage Power. On behalf of the Intervisions Healthcare family, we wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. At our clinic, birthdays are an important milestone which we celebrate. Since our doors opened in 2011, more than 1,300 at-risk mothers facing an unplanned pregnancy have chosen life. This Christmas season, join us in thanking God for the joyful blessings and the great work He's doing at Intervisions Healthcare. For more information about our clinics in West and South Des Moines, visit IVHcare.org. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, a Catholic-owned family business providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. 
Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by Golden Rule Heating and Cooling. Since 1999, Golden Rule Heating and Cooling has been supporting customers with their rules to live by. Respect, understanding, loyalty, expertise, and service. GoldenRulePHC.com Welcome back to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. My thanks again to Dr. Todd Warner. I think I need to have him on again. That was awesome. Uh, I got a lot out of that, um, as you could tell. I mean, he, he he could go on for a while. Let's let's go ahead and just assume that that's going to happen again in the future. Um, again, I think it's an important thing for all of us uh, to be fully immersed in this world and, and the beauty of the world and the beauty of the things that God has given us. Poetry is one of those those things that lifts our soul to a higher pitch, and I think it's you know something that we as Catholic men should be. Uh, at least striving with, uh, trying to wrestle with poetry. few events I'd like to point out here. Next Man Up Power Lunch is on Friday, December 10th at noon at St. Francis of Assisi in West Des Moines. Uh, that will be with Bishop William Jonesen. He's going to talk about his background, his life as a college professor, uh, and the dean of campus spiritual life and his life as a bishop. Uh, so please join us on Friday, December 10th. Also, uh, on Saturday, December 11th, is the IO Catholic Radio Dinner in December, and the speaker is Paul Zuccarelli. should be an awesome night, so you can still get tickets for that. Uh, on, that is Saturday, December 11th. So a few great events. You know, as I was thinking about this, uh, the, the timing of this episode on, on poetry happening to fall within the season of Advent. Talked last week about intentional Advent, about how to, you know, set aside this time to be a, a time of quiet and reflection. Well, you know, poetry perhaps is a way to do that. You know, I know whenever I'm chewing on poetry or whenever I'm trying to to grab a book and and to read through it quietly, it is it's always a quiet, meditative way of of spending time, of of spending quality time. Perhaps that's something you you use this Advent as a way to slow down instead of watching TV. Maybe we read poetry. Uh, maybe we choose a poem and we just kind of sit with it over the you know over, during this time of of, of diving into a, a great art at the same time uh, slowing down uh, and trying to be reflective in this season of Advent. So, thank you for joining me today on Man Up on IO Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopulis, and it's time to man up. Man up, inspiring men to live out their call to holiness. 